or you can go on the lower level, whatever okay, you prefer. Okay, okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. So Just make sure you have a mic. Okay, all right. Do they, they have one laying there on the table? Or something? We were planning to go in at the introit, but...
Wow, can you believe it? <laughs> Thank you, Marva. It's good to hear the organ. It's good to hear you playing again. And uh, we're delighted to be in the house of the Lord and to, uh, to be together. Um, Zoom just doesn't quite cut it, although we want to welcome those who are um, watching via live stream. We know some cannot be with us today. Um, I got a message here, and I didn't know if it was pertaining to this. <clears throat> we um, want to just take a few moments and uh, have some family time with regards to prayer requests and praises. Um, it's something we were doing on Zoom, and we kind of treasured that, and we wanted to just kind of, at least as we're segueing into a, a gathering like this, um, we wanted to leave that open and to see if there was anyone that wanted to share a praise or prayer request this morning. I'll start, of course, by stating what you have heard through the, um, through the uh, uh, grapevine and, and the phone system, and that is that Bill Bumgardner lost his dear wife uh, Wednesday. And his dear wife was our dear friend, a family member in this church, and a leader for our community services center. And so it is with sorrow that we grieve with um, Bill. And uh, next week the CSC will be closed um, in honor of her, uh, of her life and uh, to give the, time, the team time to, uh, to reassemble. Um, we will be celebrating her life in a memorial service next Sabbath, I'm sorry, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. here at the church. So I um, want to remind you that 6 p.m. next Wednesday, we will have a memorial. We will not have prayer meeting because of that. We will have a memorial here. So um, let's remember Bill in our prayers. And I, in that same vein, I want to uh, remind you to be praying for, uh, oh, I just drew a blank. Um, Joyce, Joyce, Still, Joyce Stills, Joyce and Daryl Stills lost their son, um, David uh, Norris, on Sunday night, and he it was a tragic accident. But do you realize that she's lost two sons now within seven months' time? I mean, that's just hard to wrap your mind around. Um, I spoke with her. She is a very strong woman. Um, doesn't mean that strong people don't cry. Doesn't mean that strong people don't hurt. And even though she could talk to you on the phone and, and remain rather calm, her heart is torn and she is, um, she's hurting desperately as she tries to uh, understand something that frankly probably will never be understood this side of eternity. Um, I'm looking at Calvin right now, lost his daughter just not that long ago, right? And there's some things you just don't get, um, but you trust. And I've found myself praying with people who go through loss and saying, Lord, help us to choose. We choose to trust you right now. Because sometimes it's only by faith. You don't necessarily feel it. You don't necessarily know what it even all looks like. You just know that I'm choosing to trust God because he's never, ever let me down. And so that's what we do in times like this. We choose to trust, though we can't see the way clearly. Um, other requests, praises. There's mics here if you want to just give a praise check. I hope it seems to be obvious to you that uh, I covet your prayers. I feel like I'm getting ready to step off into deep waters. Not All I can promise, as far as the CSC is concerned, is I will do my best to keep things moving, to keep people from going hungry. Um, 
I have no clue what I'm doing. So if you can help, please come up and help. I really, really need someone who knows people in this community who can go solicit funds for the CSC. I am not that type of person. I cannot stand to end gather. <laughs> Never have been able to do that sort of thing. So if you are that type of person and you can do end gathering, don't mind going to the credit unions and so forth, doctor's offices or whatever, and ask people to support us, please step forward. Um, Kathy was a, a dear friend, not just a, a working companion. And so I miss her dearly. Uh, but she truly was a leader. And she took charge. And she'll be missed. Thank you, Chuck. So, uh, anyone else want to share a, a praise or a prayer request? Yes, Cheryl. And go ahead, Laura. This is a little different. This is a praise Good. and an answer to prayer. Uh, some of you know I have two sons that are, were brought up in the church and have left. And uh, my oldest one is a scientist, so he thinks he's, he can know better than what God does say. But I've recently found a book. It's called Evolution Impossible. And he called me just the other night. And he's, he is accepting that he will read the book. Good that he will do it with an open mind. And I'm just asking for all your prayers that he can be touched by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Laura. I just want us to continue praying for Brad's dad and their family. Um, and praising God for the amazing witness of his parents. I didn't really know them very well, but I know my dad did. And to all of us, that beautiful marriage that was so long. So I know he's still hurting a lot too. So. Yes. In this church next Sabbath at 4 p.m., we're going to have a memorial service for Diane. Um, she, uh, she went to sleep gracefully. And um, such a graceful woman, such a beautiful lady. And it um, was quite fitting that she should go to sleep in a peaceful, graceful manner. Yes, Joyce. Well, I'm sure all of you know that my son doesn't go to church either. He was raised that way. But he was off work for the past uh, about 10 weeks. And it gave us time together that we didn't have when he was working. He'd sit down where I was and we'd start talking and I would tell him, you know, you gotta be ready. Time is short. Where are you? I didn't get any answers physically, but I think he started thinking in his life. Now, he's going back to work Monday, and I'm wearing this mask because he is a diabetic and susceptible. I'm not. My health is not that great. But I don't want to take anything home to him. I don't want to lose him now if he's on the road back. But I want to thank all of you for remembering us. And Larry Bowman built us a bluebird house last year. We were able to put it up on a fence post and we watched the bluebirds raise four babies and they're on the second nest. And that's been a real joy with him that I could share. And I want to just say, don't forget him. His name is Mark and he's still out there. Thank you, Joyce. We have a neighbor who uh, has been estranged from much of the neighborhood. Uh, for We're not sure what reasons. Maybe he had a hard life, but uh, we found out he had some new problems and he has cancer. Talked to his sister in the neighborhood. And then I 
Rhoda and I decided to text him and see, since he's been a little difficult to talk to sometimes. And so he texted me back when I said I heard he had cancer, and he said, thank you for contacting me. Because we said, I wanted to know if there's anything we could do. And he said, I want to ask you to forgive me for not being a good neighbor. For uh, telling you, so he'd tell us where we couldn't walk and around his property. And he said, you can walk anywhere you want now. And I'm humbled and thankful that you, you said that you want to help me. So we're grateful to the Lord for melting his heart. Amen. Now that he, we should be able to talk to him now. Amen. Ah, oh, that's a good story. Amen. Yes, Connie. Yellow mic. Yeah, yellow mic. Yellow mic. Oh, you know? Okay. It's not. Praise God. We're glad that your mama's thinking a little more clearly. That's good. So I have a praise and a prayer request. Um, about two weeks ago, um, talking to my parents, found out that my grandpa in Sao Paulo, Brazil, had uh, contracted COVID-19 and was in the ICU intubated. And with all of his pre-line health conditions, they didn't think he was going to make it through. Uh, Friday, yesterday night, when I talked to my parents, he has made it through. He's out of ICU, no longer intubated, and recovering in a recovery room. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, 89 years old. How? And 89. Wow. And uh, made it through. And, and prayers for the family. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, third largest uh, city in the world. Very high stress. And there's a lot of disease in that city. Uh, you know, so... A lot contributed to the stress. Like, yeah. So prayers for the family and, and all the ones that live in large cities and are susceptible to the, yeah. the thing. And great praise that. Sure. He's made it through. So Praise God. 89. A couple more here. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I've got a praise for my grandchildren. My oldest son, which he used to go to the Sabbath school here a lot, and we moved to, way to Maryville now. He lives in Knoxville. He had rejected God, and he's been doing that for many years now. And he, he, he would tell Zoe and Desmond, my grandchildren, him and his wife, that God doesn't exist. And they were afraid to say anything to me. But the other day, they said, Grandma, you know, Mom and Dad says God doesn't exist, but I know that he does. So that's been a prayer that God could use the grandchildren to bring my son back into the church. And also, there was a, I work at a fitness center, and I signed a lady up, and we, we kind of communicated for a year, but I was, well, I hired her for an employee, and she said, well, I just want to let you know I don't work Friday evenings or Saturdays. And she says, I'm a Sabbath keeper. And I'm like, well, praise God. <laughs> so it's just been a blessing, but the, her personal trainer is the one that I've been working with, talking about the Sabbath, and, and she's an ex-Catholic, but she's a Protestant, and she agrees with everything I say. So this lady's getting kind of double bombarded now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just really great to have a coworker that is standing up, and now people are wondering why me and this other girl doesn't work on the Sabbath, you know. So it's been a blessing that uh, God's work, but just to keep our family in prayers and everything, and my children, and everyone that's going through the crisis and everything that's going through with the COVID-19 or the, the rights that we have and everything. Just we know that Jesus is in control and uh, we just need to, this is a time where God's holding the winds back so we can get our act together. The, as Adventists, 
we need to get our act together and we need to get uh, more closer to God so our character can be developed so he can use us. Thank you. Amen. It's good to see your mom and daddy here too. Good to see y'all. Yes. I want to praise God. They're opening the nursing homes this week. They're going to let families in. I don't know how they're going to do it. And Morning Point had no cases of anything positive. So now they're allowed to go out in their courts and they're allowed to walk outside. They're not allowed to be close to each other, but they're still allowed to go outside now. So I praise God for that. Yes. This uh, whole experience has made us thankful for the, uh, what once seemed to be ordinary. And I want to praise for that. I'm looking at Lisa. And I just want to praise the Lord. You know, Lisa, you, you came to a, a prophecy series about two years ago, I guess. You've studied with Brenda for some time. And today, you are making your decision for baptism and will be baptized at Paint Creek. Amen? Yeah. We're, uh, we're excited. And um, we will... Um, Lisa, I didn't tell you this, and so it's probably good because that way you're not worried, you didn't get nervous. But come on up here, Lisa, and um, I hope hope you will. <laughs> and uh, this is not in the thing. We'll have prayer in just a moment, but. Um, want, to, want to just take a moment, Lisa. I'm looking here in my library. Um, I want to just take a moment, Lisa, to go over these vows with you because you, um, what's your background, uh, faith-wise? <laughs> Catholic. Catholic. And Catholic are beautiful people. Amen? Rituals. Rituals Amen. are good people, but they're the, rituals. They don't. Yes, it's lots of ritual. It just didn't, it didn't satisfy us, is what you No, you it said. doesn't. And it doesn't change as you get older. It's the same. It's the same. same. Yeah. And so I think it's been palpable, your enthusiasm for what you've been learning. And um, to hear you share in prayer meeting and to hear what's been going on with you and Brenda at your time together. Um, to see you at the prophecy. I don't think you missed one single prophecy. Maybe one. Did I you missed miss one. one. I was you out missed town. one. But otherwise, she made it to every single presentation. Wasn't able to come to this last series, but not because you didn't want to, just health reasons. But um, let's just go briefly through these. Um, and this is a praise. And I want you to reseal that commitment in your own heart. Do you believe, uh, Lisa, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that they're a, a unity of three? Yes. Okay. Um, I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I'm saved from sin and its penalty. Yes. I renounce the world in its sinful ways and have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior and believe that God for Christ's sake has forgiven my sins and given me a new heart. Yes. Amen. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, recognizing him as my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary and claim his promise to strengthen me by his indwelling spirit so that I may receive power to do his will. Amen. Amen. She's nodding, y'all. Um, <laughs> I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word and that it constitutes the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. Yes. I accept the Ten Commandments as still binding upon Christians. And it is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord. Yes. I look forward to the soon coming of Jesus as the blessed hope in my heart. And I am determined to be ready to meet the Lord, to do all in my power to witness to his loving salvation. And by life and word, help others to be ready for his glorious appearing. Yes, amen. I accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. Most definitely. I believe in church organization. It's my purpose to support the church by my tithes and offerings and my personal influence and effort. I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I will honor God by care, caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, 
the use, manufacture, or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse of trafficking in narcotics or other drugs. No, I will never do that. Never, never. She said no, but what she meant is she'll never do that. And that's what she said. <laughs> Just clarify. Um, I know and understand. Nervous. You're supposed to say yes, Lisa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I know and understand for the fundamental belief, Bible principles is taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it is my purpose by the grace of God to order my life in harmony with these principles. Yes. I accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion mm -hmm. and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of yes. my faith. And lastly... I accept the Seventh-day Adventist Church as the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, and this is pivotal in light of world events today, right? It is a church for every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship, and I desire to be a member of the lo this local congregation of the world church. Yes. So Amen. Is there a motion we accept her pending her baptism? I mean, all in favor, just right. It's, it's unanimous. It's unanimous. <laughs> we love you, Lisa. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. We're not supposed to do that. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, let me. Huh? Yeah, that's the first time. We'll have to do Okay. Larry, come up and pray for us. We've had many praises this morning, and we closed with a big one there. Please pray. Thank you very much. It is so good to be back in church. Wow, I've missed this so much. Uh, let's kneel before the Lord as we pray. Father in heaven, it is so good to be here. And we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that we can come here and worship you. We ask that you will watch over us, protect us, Keep us healthy. Bless this church. Let it be a light on a hill here in Greenville. Many people know about the Adventist people, and so we thank you for that. We thank you that we can be a positive influence in this community and for you. Take our hearts. We give them to you. We surrender our lives to you. We want to do your will and be your servants. We ask that you will bless us today as we worship you and as we meet with you. And, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and be with us. And, and the, we thank you for the angels that are here. And for the love that we have for one another, that we can support one another and hold each other up. And we thank you so much for the ones that have come forward this morning with prayer requests, and there are many others that have prayer requests on their hearts, and they have silent requests, and you know each one. You know our hearts. And Father, we think, we think this morning of several that have, have come to the microphone and, and have uh, expressed their hearts' feelings. And we think of the MD family, Father. We, we think of Diane and you know, a wife and a mother, a grandmother, and we just ask that you will bless this family. And we thank you that we have the blessed hope of the soon return of Jesus Christ. And we'll be able to be reunited with our loved ones. And we think of Daryl and Joyce Steele and the loss of another son, David, two within seven months. And we just ask that you will bring peace to them. And for, of course, Bill Baumgartner and his family and the support that they give at the loss of Kathy and what a shock it was to get that call Wednesday morning. We just worked with her Tuesday morning at the center and it just uh, was unbelievable. I, I still don't think it has fully sunk in. But we ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to Bill and his family Give them the strength that they need and, and the peace that can only come because of your love for us and the assurance that we will see our loved ones again. Father, we think of the leaders at the center, with Bill and Chuck and, and the, all the volunteers that come, but you heard the expression on Chuck's voice this morning of 
we really don't know where to turn or, or what to do, but, but you will guide. You will guide Bill and, and Chuck, and so all the volunteers we ask that you will bless in a special way. We think of our school and uh, for the way we've had to end this year, and we praise your name for the, for the graduates, our very first 12th grade graduation that's coming up on the 18th, and we just praise your name for that, and we ask for your, your blessings. We thank you so much that Lisa Johnson has joined our family. It is always joy and singing in heaven to have a new member of the family. And we thank you for it, and we look forward to her baptism later on today. And we thank you for Cheryl's testimony of sharing her books with her sons and uh, we just pray that it, they will have a strong influence on their lives and in these turbulent times father there are many people that that will turn to you and so we ask that they will turn to you and Joyce also she was talking about spending time with with her son Mark and and letting him know that time is short and people realize that I think more than more than ever. Everything that happens around us is a sign that, that, uh, that your coming is soon. And so we, we thank you that we can be part of that. We thank you that Arvo had the opportunity to contact his neighbor. We pray that his neighbor will receive the treatment that he needs. But the humbling and the softening of the heart is what it takes to be a, a child of your, yours. We think of, of Connie Smith and her mother, and she lives so far away, and but we think, thank you for the good report that she had this morning, and we pray for her. And we think of Max's grandfather. He's out of the ICU, he's doing better, he's 89 years old, and we want to remember him and the family and we want to lift them up in prayer. And Joanne's son, we, we pray that he will realize. And we, you know, I can't help but think we all have, well, we have sons that have rejected God and gone away, but we hope that the, the Holy Spirit will work on each one and bring them back to you and help them to be a part of the family of God. And the good report uh, from Susan, uh, the opening of the nursing homes and being able to get outside and get some sunshine and fresh air, we thank you for that. We want to think of Milton and Ann. We want to lift them up. And he will be going to Oklahoma for treatments. And so we just pray that you will guide them. And we thank you for their ministry and uh, the Sabbath school that he had this morning. Father, our list is long, and uh, each of us have, have prayer requests on our hearts. But we thank you for the promise that we have of your soon return. We thank you of the blessed hope that we have and the assurance that we have if we're faithful to you and keep your commandments and have the faith of Jesus, we will see you soon. We look forward to that time. So, Father, bless us as a family and help us to represent you and bring other people to you and be a blessing to the, our neighbors around us. Help us all to be ready when you come, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. 
Our scripture this morning is Proverbs 27, verses 1 through 9, if you would like to follow along with me. Proverbs 27, 1 to 9. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. A stone is heavy, and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. Wrath is cruel, and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? Wrath is cruel, and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. Ointment and perfume delight the heart, but the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. May God add his blessings to his word. Good morning, church family. It's nice to see all of you here. It's nice to be here myself. And uh, may God bless us all. The offering for this morning is going to be for church budget. And um, this uh, title for this talk this morning is uh, A Chaplain Who Serves and Lives Are Saved. Brad Brown lost his wife to cancer only five months before the devastating campfire de destroyed Paradise, California. And uh, he worked as a chaplain in nearby Adventist Hospital when the, fire, when the fire developed the entire region. He called his two teenage, two teenage children and told them that he loved them, after which he lost his cell phone coverage. More than 80% of the paradise was lost and closed, and close to 90 facilities were reported. When the fire was, all, was the most intense, Brad decided to use his minivan to transport critical care and hospice patients from the burning hospital to safety. His actions and service saved lives. Time Magazine named Brad Brown one of the heroes of 2018. Nearly 1,300 Adventist church members were affected, with many losing everything except their lives. In crises like these, it's inspiring to witness the outpouring of support from our faithful support from our faithful community. Today, let us give to our local church budget to support those in need in times like this. In June, um, yes, um, okay, uh, we will, uh, in lieu of picking up the offering of deacons, we will have ushers or there will be offering plates in the back to give our offerings as for giving offerings, the children's offerings could be in, uh, put online as well as our personal offerings or that mailed. But uh, for today, if you have it in hand, you can deposit it at the back at the end of the service. So if we'll bow our heads now, we'll have a prayer for the offering. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the blessings that you have given and bestowed upon us Help us now to respond to the blessings that you have bestowed upon us by giving of, showing of our gratitudes through our means. Thank you now for loving us and for blessing us and for blessing what we have blessed those that we give to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Also, the children, of course, will remain in their seats as the story is being told. Thank you. Is okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. It's such a joy to be here, and it's just my heart's just so happy to be here with the fellowship of all of you. I know it's been a t trying time for a lot of people, but it's also been a blessing in many, many ways, especially on the farm. Yeah, I know a lot of you may live on a farm, and we do, and there's lots of exciting things happen in the spring of the year. A farmer's very busy in the spring. And uh, lots of things happening. I hope you kids have been enjoying your family time. I know when we're working and busy, normally we don't spend as much time together, maybe taking walks or just spending time around the table, talking or playing games with our children. And on the farm, there's so many new things that happen. The, the, of course, lots of chores inside that start all the time. But in the spring, there's more things to do outside. As many of y'all may know, if you do live on a farm, you have to mow the grass. Kids may be doing some of that. I know as you get older, you have more chores to do. So weed eating, and there's the planting of the garden. Hopefully, how many of y'all have got a garden planted? I'm sure lots of you have got a garden. Kids, I'm sure you've all got flower gardens and helping in the garden, which is a wonderful experience for all of you. So you're learning lots. And what's another exciting thing that happens on the farm in the spring? Does anybody, can somebody tell me? birth and i know the kennedys they've got some new colts i'm anxious to maybe go out and see they're beautiful i've seen pictures and then of course uh the, she the the sheep being born the little lambs and of course on our farm we used to have sheep we now have lots of birds on our farm malachi well our kids love animals and we have to have goats and a horse but our big thing right now has been birds of all kinds and malachi and adrian have been busy gathering eggs and they've been enjoying that as well but uh they does anybody know what a baby uh, guinea is called? Does anybody have a clue what a baby guinea bird is called? It's called a keet. So we've had chicks and ducks and goslings and even keets just recently born on our farm. And it's been exciting because normally to have a geese born on the farm is very unusual. They don't very many of them su survive. So the kids have been really excited. They actually, one of them hatched out and, and the kids wanted to leave it with his mama and well unfortunately that one didn't survive so malachi was quick there's two more eggs getting ready to hatch out he said mommy he said i'm bringing them inside he said they're going to be all right so anyways needless to say he took them in put them in the incubator and they did survive so we've got little goslings running around the farm too so we're excited about that and also amongst all of that we even had a, our dog maggie had a litter of pups so we've been enjoying lots of little puppies running around. We gave all, all of them's gone except one. You know, we got to keep one. So one more animal to the farm, which is one too many, maybe. But we're really enjoying it. So it's important as kids to let them experience all these wonderful things on the farm. They're learning lots about God's creation and learning about taking care of things and learning about life and just the love that they have to share with those animals. Now, hopefully you have had time to really focus on what's going on. We need to be paying attention because this is the end of times and God is preparing our hearts. He's wanting us to be ready. And yes, I want to show you, I've got some things. Some of these things you all may be doing at your house, but our house, we've been doing some extra things and uh, let me show you a few of them. Now, if y'all don't know Walt, the mustard seed, uh, he's got lots of good things to store, but one of them we've been taking is elderberry. I don't know if y'all take any elderberry, but some people don't take too much. Just a little dab will do you on some of that. So everybody, different dose for different people. And, of course, we've been, uh, oh, here's another one, maybe zinc, maybe a little zinc. And something that's real easy to take that's good for a lot of things. Maybe a lot of people don't know, but what are these? Lemons. Lemons are good for so many things. It's cheap. It's good for lots of things. Full of vitamin C. And I know they're saying for the, the virus, 
that you drink need to drink lots of if you drink lot, lots of warm drinks. So take a cup of hot water, put some lemons in it. If you want to sweeten it with honey, put a little honey in it. But that helps soothe your throat. It's good for people that have laryngitis. I mean, it's good when you for lots of things, and it's full of vitamin C. Real simple to do. Now I know there's another thing that some people do, and I'm not the best person to do this. I'm a huggy person. And I like to give hugs and kisses, and so I have to be real careful to keep my social distancing. So if I don't, I apologize. I mean to, but sometimes I forget. But I know a lot of people are wearing the mask, and that's wonderful, and it's a way of protecting us and protecting others. But what's the most important thing that we need during this time? Does anybody have an idea what we need? Prayer, but what, and what else? What do we need? We need to carry it everywhere we go. We need this book right here. We need to take it with us. We need to study it. And we need to share it with other people. What a perfect time. If I see if I got it. I need to know this. I need to keep this with me all the time. And I do. It's little. Ah, yes. Now we talk about this in our Sabbath school all the time. And unfortunately I didn't get to do a close track story this morning. And I apologize to my class. But kids you know what these are. Glow tracks. There are all kinds of glow tracks. So what a perfect time right now. People are hurting. They're lonely. They're needing something to give them courage. So a lot of people are just so discouraged. Satan's working hard to make everything go crazy. Hatred and sickness and loneliness, depression. And this is the perfect time to spread God's word and sharing these with our neighbors. Sharing God's word with our neighbors and reaching out to those that are hurting. Kids, you all can call. You know, even your grandparents. There's people in your family that are by themselves. Call them and say, Grandma, I love you today thinking of you or your neighbor take him a loaf of bread I know a lot of you all have done these things already but take a glow track you know there's this farm this month is farmers month do June dairy days and thank a farmer well thank a farmer and give him a glow track or thank the farmer and give her a glow track you know there's lots of ways to do this but the main thing is to spread God's word share his love with others I, I pray every day Lord let us be a blessing today and I'm not a perfect person I made a lot of mistakes but ask God to let you be a blessing. Let you touch someone's life and share his love with other people. And that's what, kids, you are the one person that, as, as she said today, you all can make a difference where us adults can't sometimes. You can change your heart. And I've seen it happen with my own kids and, and other kids here in the congregation throughout the community. You can make a difference. So please, I ask you to take a gold track, say a prayer, call someone, draw a picture. Kids, y'all are really good artists, some of you. Take, draw a picture and give it to your neighbor. Tell them you love them. Give them a hug. Well, may have to keep your to throw a kiss. <laughs> but anyways, I encourage you to do those things. So Lord, let's bow our head here and have a prayer with the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here this morning. It's such a joy to be here in the presence of others. And yes, spring's a beautiful time of year to see new birth and to see your majestic uh, creation and seeing things just come to life. It's beautiful. So, Lord, help us to be a blessing to those around us. Help us to spread your love. And we just thank you for the gift of life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, giving us wisdom and courage to stand up for you, Jesus. We need to trust not to be afraid. Help us to be like Daniel and be strong and be, be, have courage to be brave and trust you that you will take care of your people. And, Lord, we just love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen and Kayla. She had a little trouble with her her uh, instrument before we went out there, and so it was a relief that it all came together for God's glory. You know, even though it's been had its share of uh, setbacks or disappointments and so forth, uh, I've heard some positives that have come out of COVID. Amen. Haven't you? Um, I think one of the most stark positive testimonies that I heard was several weeks ago when one of you shared how your schedule was so booked that you didn't see a free weekend until June and how this forced the whole family just to stop and get to be together and enjoy spring. And uh, I think uh, that has been a blessing many of us could identify with. The world keeps turning, right? Um, The story is told about Becky and how she prepared a pasta dish for a party that she was planning to give that evening. In her haste, however, she forgot to refrigerate the pasta sauce. And it sat on the counter all day long. She was worried, of course, about spoilage. So she... uh, was in a jam because it was too late to cook up another batch. And so she called Poison Control Center. She voiced her concern. Poison Control advised Becky to boil the sauce again and that it should probably be okay. That night, the phone rang during dinner. One of the guests volunteered to answer it, and her face dropped as she called out, It's Poison Control. They wanted to know how the spaghetti sauce turned out. You ever, you ever found yourself a bit embarrassed? Such unpleasant predicaments often cause us to scurry for some type of cover. We don't like our weaknesses to be exposed, our failures, our mistakes. We don't like to be rebuked, whether that rebuke be verbal or, in this case, circumstantial. Yes, when we are embarrassed, we find ourselves easily tempted to cover up, to deny, become angry, or even argumentative. However, with words that are rightly spoken, truth can, be more ap- can more aptly take root in the soil of the mind and take a firm hold. This morning, I would like to speak about the importance of a faithful rebuke. In this and third installment in our Elijah series, which we began on Zoom, I've entitled the message just that, A Faithful Rebuke. Let us pray. Lord, would you speak to us this morning amidst the distractions of the world? We just want to come and it feels good to be in this sacred space, to be with family, ones that we love and trust, even amidst the grief and the tears, the aching hearts, amidst the joy of a neighbor that's opened up. Amidst all these stories, Lord, we, we gather and collectively bow at your feet. Would you speak to us words that will admonish and shape us and form us into your image, that we might be prepared to see your glory when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. In this Elijah series, we began with a look at how God provided for Elijah by the brook Cherith, and later with the widow of Zarephath. We noted several points from those first two stories, that first, the very thing God provided, that is the stream of water, was dried up because of Elijah's pronouncement to Ahab. 
That is that sometimes what God grants us will dry up when we are faithful, but we must remember that this is often a prelude to a blessing. It's our next step for growing faith. We also noted how God led him to the widow of Zarephath, that when he met her and asked her for something to eat, she stated her predicament, her dire situation, which would have led most of us to surmise, well, I found the wrong widow. We noted how tempting it would be to merely operate on human reason alone. Surely this wasn't the one, but God doesn't waste opportunities, does he? For the, he wasn't just growing Elijah's faith, but he was going to use the time of growing Elijah's faith to also grow this widow's faith. For the very thing Elijah needed, the widow had to surrender so that she in turn could receive the blessing. And for it is when we give what we need to those in need that God will provide our need. Amen? We also noted how this story of prophecy is clearly depicted in Revelation 11 and 12. For indeed, just as 11 mentions the witnesses and mentions the famine or the, uh, uh, the drought, so we see this depicted in the story of Elijah. For the wilderness and the earth are depicted also in Revelation 12, and it was the wilderness, it was the earth that provided protection to God's prophets. The wilderness protecting the means for Elijah, the cave or the earth protecting the hundred prophets that Obadiah cared for. Then last week, we looked at the story of how Elijah was raised up the widow's son. We first noted how she allowed her circumstances to affect her faith. And thus the warning is for us. Don't let your views of God be directed by your circumstance. Such theology can be quickly become dangerous. She thought, well, if my son has now been taken from me, then God must be angry with me. I must be suffering the punishment of God, the wrath of God, she was allowing her circumstance to de define her theology. Second, we noted that Elijah doesn't argue with this woman who is obviously having a moment of stress in her faith. He could have easily been defensive when she complained to him about his presence in her home, just as Moses kind of lost it a bit at the rock when the Israelites kept complaining. But instead, Elijah goes and speaks plainly, directly, in a raw type manner with the Lord as he intercedes on behalf of this woman. Here's the key, that rather than try to explain or defend, he simply takes upon himself her pain. How often do we not try to explain, to defend, rather than shoulder the questions and burdens of those in distress? Sometimes the best solution to a theological question is simply to demonstrate God's love rather than to try to articulate it with words. Lastly, we noted how Elijah came close and identified with the boy three times by stretching himself out over the boy, reminding us that this was but a demonstration of what the gospel would be, giving this lady a, 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 an example of what would be done for her someday. He identified himself with, by stretching out upon the boy, just as Jesus would one day stretch himself out upon a cross. So we must identify with the needs of others. And rather than simply offer up a prayer, remember to stretch ourselves out. To not just reach up, but reach out. Chapter 17, hear me carefully, is a reminder of what God wishes for his people as they prepare for the great end time showdown. We need alone time with God. We need to dine with him as we see in Revelation chapter 3. We must understand that when following Jesus, we should expect dead ends, apparent dead ends. That such moments, though, are merely a bend in the road. And when we go by faith around the corner, we will find again that it was a prelude to a blessing. 
for he could have left Elijah by the brook for the whole time. But instead he took him to Zarephath, the town whose name means to refine. And thus it was in ministry that he further refined the character of Elijah. So we should expect that as we grow in Christ, God will stretch us. He will use us to bring redemption to others and hence establish more deeply our own salvation. Today, we want to look at chapter 18. And I would invite you to open there, 1 Kings 18. We've, we've looked at 17. I want to look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 to 18. We're looking at the story of Elijah. Notice what it says. It says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. There was roughly around 2,000 caves, they tell us, in that region, that are in that region. So he had many options, if you will. Verse 5, Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, as Obadiah was on his way, verse 7, suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your master, Elijah is here. And so he said, How have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he'll kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. He will kill me? He will kill me. Then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And then it happened. When Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you? O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Three primary characters in this story. Thus far, first, Ahab. His character is selfish and bitter. When famine strikes, rather than worry about his people for whom he is responsible, rather than concern himself with God and his requirements, all he is concerned with is greener pastures, quite literally, with protecting his investments. Consider, when COVID hit, I mean, it hit quite a while ago, but when it actually came home to us in mid-March that this was uh, really hitting and affecting us, 
And as we watch the stock market begin to crumble, now if you're like me, the stock market, oh, I guess my retirement's in the stock market, but I have to say I didn't really flinch too much over the stock market. It was curious, but, but I'm asking, where were your concerns? Was it about uh, what you would eat, about your job, about the, the investments? My question is, is, can we at all identify with Ahab? Ahab's second primary focus was on bitterness and hatred. For due, for due to the influence of his wife, he believed Elijah to be the troubler of Israel. So during this three and a half year stint, really a three year period of famine, but a half year prior to that leading up to the famine, many today are either doubting and refuting the message of scripture and casting doubt upon its authority or they cast doubt upon the spirit of prophecy just like Ahab did during this three and a half year drought for example like Ahab some today will take the Bible and say the New Testament is inspired but that the Old Testament is uh, well it was for the Jews yesteryear or they will say for example that Revelation you know is a closed book you've heard these stories so today, some will look at the spirit of prophecy. And while they may read the conflict of the ages, they will quickly set the testimonies for the church aside, saying, these things are too hard. You hear me? As though the testimonies are something of the Old Testament and the conflict of the ages are more of the new. Enter Obadiah. He was faithful to the prophets. He hid them in the caves, preserving their ministry and their influence. Today, God's word, the spirit of prophecy, are under attack. And God is looking for a people to be faithful, to preserve and to protect his holy instruction. Just as the Waldensians of old preserved the word, so this word, this work is to continue. And yes, if we don't read it, both the Old and the New Testament, if we don't study the spirit of prophecy, yes, both the conflict of the ages and the testimonies for the church, which I'll just be frank with you, there's not a great side of difference. If we don't study these, we are ill-prepared. How can we share what we haven't studied? If I may just for a moment speak to these testimonies. And again, I believe, and I, I, if, if you don't, that's, that's your right. I believe that these are inspired um, of God. I believe the word of God is the inspired word of God. Amen? It is holy from Genesis to Revelation. The whole book, all the book, not one jot or tittle is not for us to take to heart. Amen? For Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner, will first give up, oh, this is a quote, I'm sorry, testimonies, or selected messages, 1903. Notice it says, one thing is certain, those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. In other words, those who are fast to capitulate to the demands of Satan and his evil host will be those who have set aside for a rainy day these precious counsels we've been given. One more statement. Notice, the enemy has made his masterly efforts to unsettle the faith of our own people and the testimonies. This is just as Satan designed it should be. And those who have been preparing the way for the people to pay no heed to the warnings and reproof of the testimonies of the Spirit of God will see that a tide of errors of all kinds will spring into life. You see, we need to take seriously God's counsel for this hour. Allowing it to do its appointed work in our lives. Not in the neighbor's life. Not in, oh, I wish so-and-so would read this. But in our life. To set aside the hard sayings that we've been given. is like the rich man who walked away when Jesus' appeal was too pointed. Too practical. Let's not give up in our study. In our preparation, for we know not the hour. Not only did Obadiah protect the prophets, but Obadiah was faithful to the prophets as we see by his hiding them in caves and his bowing before Elijah. 
But we see too that he was a man who was used in a, in a more behind the scenes type of manner. Yes, he served as a governor to the king. Yes, he rubbed shoulders with the elite. But his ministry was in some ways much more subtle than that of Elijah. But his ministry was no less great. For example, don't you think that the bread he fed those prophets came from the king's pantry? Right? I bet that was some good bread. His connections, his faithfulness, remind us of the people like Joseph and Moses and Daniel. When God places his people in high places, they need much prayer. I think of people like Ben Carson. People like uh, Barry Black. These men are playing a role in this end time game for Jesus. Men who have the opportunity to serve the Lord amidst the corruption of government, yes, they need much prayer. Third character, Elijah. God has prepared him for this important moment. We just studied it in Revelation, our first Kings 17. Thus, Elijah is calm and Elijah is direct. He speaks with confidence in his God, which is the means for encouraging the fearful but faithful Obadiah. For when he speaks, you see it there in the text, when he speaks in the name of the Lord, Obadiah argues not anymore, but promptly leaves on his assigned mission. God needs men and women who are so in tune with his will that when they see what the prophet has written, they will go straight forward on the course given. Amen? Not stand there and argue, well, maybe that was for her time or for their time. or Maybe Paul was writing, well, no, it was for them. Secondly, Elijah invites Ahab to come to him. Don't you love it? It's no small matter that the king comes before the prophet instead of the prophet coming before the king. It's no small matter that the king brings his armed men and security detail with him to meet the prophet. But the prophet stands alone, though if you could only see as God sees, you'd see a heavenly security detail. Amen? It is obvious who is in command here. Mind you, the prophet is, but the ambassador for the king of heaven is standing there in full calm surrender to the king of kings. And thus he fears not this earthly king who has been seeking to kill him for three and a half years. Ahab, in an attempt to appear confident, calls Elijah to his face the troubler of Israel. And we know from inspiration that we will, as a people, be called the troubler of this great land. When the calamity becomes so intense and the apparent divide so clear that we will be the ones who are accused of the trouble that rests upon the land. But Elijah unflinchingly responds to this uh, statement by Ahab and rebukes Ahab and calls a spade a spade, saying, it is your rejection of God's law. It is your worship and following after the Baals that has caused this trouble in Israel. Let's face it, does it not at times seem very apparent that America is facing judgment? Elijah has been hunted by the man for three and a half years, but now he invites him to come to him, and yet he speaks with such daring authority. You don't call someone's bluff like that in mere human armor and authority. You must be protected and directed by God to speak so, so calmly and directly. Today we see trouble all around us, and yet how few God has to speak with such authority and with such calm, with such certainty. Let's face it, when... When COVID stri struck, there was all this scattering and, 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 and um, blog posts and, 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 and um, 
theories floating around as to what, where are we? What is this? A scramble of sorts. Did you sense it? Did you feel it? But before we can extend rebuke, we must be willing to receive rebuke. Rebuke is not a bad thing. Proverbs offers, numer- offers many texts, numerous uh, texts that extend clarity to the blessings and warnings with regards to rebuke. <clears throat> Proverbs 10, 17, the one who rejects reproof leads others astray. Proverbs 12, 1 says that one who rejects rebuke is a fool, is stupid, despises himself. Whoever hates reproof will die. Poverty and disgrace come to him. But for those who accept rebuke, the promised blessings are many. Whoever heeds reproof is honored, is prudent. He who listens to reproof gains intelligence. Proverbs 15, 32. Loves knowledge, will dwell among the wise, and is on the path of life. Because the rod and reproof give wisdom. Proverbs 29, 15. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Proverbs 6, 23. To the one who embraces rebuke, God says, I will pour out my spirit to you. But to the one who despises it, I will laugh at your calamity. When we ruin, Proverbs 29, 1 says that when ruin comes for the fool who resists reproof, it will be sudden and devastating. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. In commenting on this passage found here in 1 Kings 18, verse 18, where Elijah rebukes Ahab, we read this in Prophets and Kings. The smooth sermon so often preached make no lasting impression. The trumpet does not give a certain sound. Men are not cut to the heart by the plain, sharp truths of God's word. There are many professed Christians who, if they should express their real feelings, would say, What need is there of speaking so plainly? They might as well ask, why need John the Baptist have said to the Pharisees, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why need he have provoked the anger of Herodias by telling Herod that it was unlawful for him to live with his brother's wife? The forerunner of Christ lost his life by his plain speaking. Why could he not have moved along without incurring the displeasure of those who are living in sin. So men who should be standing as faithful guardians of God's law have argued till policy has taken the place of faithfulness and sin is allowed to go unreproved. When will the voice of faithful rebuke be heard once more in the church? Prophets and Kings 140 to 141. I remember when I was, I think I've told you this, but maybe you forgot. I remember when I was in my first assignment. I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I went to lunch with Tina. We had no children at the time. We went to lunch at this home, sweet couple, older couple. And... um, I remember sitting in their home, having a nice meal together, sharing, and then after lunch, we went into their living room, and they said they had something they wanted to show us, and so they turned on the, not television, but on their VCR or whatever, and um, showed us a few clips. Now, this was, maybe I was just young, I don't think I really knew who this guy was, but, um, and I'm not here to speak ill of the gentleman. But a preacher was on the screen, and I, I don't think I'd ever heard of him, and he was preaching, and I don't remember how long the clip was. I don't know that we watched the whole sermon, but it was a pastor named Joel Olstein. You ever heard of him? And I um, watched this sermon for a while, and then afterwards, I was a bit taken back when I sort of figured out in my 20-something naivety that they were basically saying, we need to hear more sermons like this. Um, let the truth cut she writes I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is that they are afraid of hurting feelings 
And as false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth things, the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and leave the result with God. Yes, people, God's people, are told that we will be called troublers of Israel in these last days. But if we have prepared for the hour by feeding upon the word of God and witnessing for him, then we will be able to herald faithfully the Elijah message, which we will look at in a couple of weeks. But here is where I speak a note of caution for us as a people. May we be diligent and careful that we not become like Ahab and shut down the exhortation and rebuke that may need to be given from time to time. Like with the testimonies for the church, when exhortation, which may conflict with my lifestyle or my habits, thus turning an exhortation into a rebuke, comes my way, I must ask, what is my response? When the exhortation strikes at some cherished habit or practice of my children, do I shield and protect them, or shall I say me, from the prophet or the preacher? We are typically fine with generalities, you know, empty platitudes, or if we keep such exhortation directed to others, why, it's quite palatable. But the moment it becomes too practical, useful, dare I say, like we see with the testimonies for God's church, when specifics are mentioned, thus making the exhortation into something more of a rebuke, how do we respond? Sometimes we will respond like, well, I don't think that it is a salvational issue. Hmm? Or, we sh we sh no, you shouldn't judge. Or you don't have a close enough relationship, excuse me, to speak to me or my child like that. Or we say that the specifics, you know, are dated or judgmental. Or, well, you get the idea. We have our responses, don't we? I ask you, are you guilty? of responding in such a manner? Am I guilty of responding in such a manner? And please, let me be clear. Rebuke is not to be rude. Amen? It is to be straight and clear, but not rude. Elijah and John the Baptist, I find it interesting we're both known for their stern, sort of rough exterior, but it doesn't mean they were unkind. And keep in mind the times in which they lived. I mean, it was a rough place. To, it was a rough time to watch the news in, in Ahab's day, right? The atrocity, the pain, the suffering, that the children who didn't went to bed with their, their bellies pooched out and hungry because there just wasn't enough food in the land. This is not a time for exhortation. Can you hear it? Can you listen to it in John the Baptist's day? I mean, corruption was all around. John the Baptist, why is he preaching like that? I mean, we need something more comforting than that. Amen? Are you with me? I'm not saying we shouldn't comfort one another. We should. Amen? But there is a time if, if Jesus is almost here, and we have rebelliously kept our hands in whatever our cookie jar may be, then don't you want somebody to help you see where your hand is at? Amen? I mean, even though Elijah, according to inspiration, was quoted, I quote, a stern, he was stern, I want you to remember how he responded to the widow who just lost her son. Right? He didn't come down like, where is your faith? We've been eating together all these months, and now you're acting like this? No, it was none of that, right? He took her pain, and he laid himself out. 
Therefore, some points that we should keep in mind when giving or receiving rebuke. First, keep it in the family. Keep it in the family. We don't need to air dirty laundry, right? Avoid social media and the internet when at all possible. Dare I underline that? Listen, when we rebuke others, even our country's leaders, and get into politics, oh, this is dangerous territory, but when we get heavily into politics over persons, we could stand for issues, but we, I only want to stand behind Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We don't need to take sides. We just don't. It, it ruins, it corrupts our witness. Outside, I'm sorry. But we need to keep our rebuke in the family. Let's face it, cowards often resort to the path of least resistance. That's why they're crooked like a stream. And social media is often such a venue. And so in the name of rebuke, they will castigate those who have done wrong and publicly denounce their errors. Now, while there is a time and place for public rebuke, let's be clear, the public does not necessarily mean the world. Right? The world doesn't need to hear about our mistakes and problems, for they are far too eager to point out the faults of God's end-time church. When you use the web to herald rebuke, you place into the hands of the enemy abundant resources for att attacking the bride of Christ. Just don't go there, if at all possible. Let's not spend so much def time defending one candidate or castigating another. Let's defend the gospel. Follow Matthew 18. Second point, follow Matthew 18. It is true that if someone persists in rebellion and you have followed the path of Matthew 18 by first going privately to, to them first, bringing an elder secondly and visiting them, and then if they still persist in their rebellion, going to the church. But it doesn't ever say to go beyond the church, does it? Does it? It doesn't. <laughs> and when they refuse, when they rebel against the church's counsel, the instruction then given is to treat them like a heathen. And the Bible has a whole chapter dedicated on that in Luke 15. You know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. That's how you treat a heathen. Number three, love requires honesty. Proverbs 27 verse 5 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. If we truly love our neighbor, we won't, ne won't neglect their need to, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. You sometimes see misguided love with parents as their kids enter their teenage years. We just became one of those families with a teenager. But, you know, that does no big deal to me. I get, I get, I, I, you could just, just FYI, please don't come and say, oh, they're a teenager. I, I don't want to hear that. I'm just being honest. Because they're just one year older than they were when they were 12. Right? Don't let society define what our young people should be. Let's not expect something that they shouldn't be. Amen? You say, oh, you'll learn uh, no, I'm trusting by the grace of God. You see, sometimes see misguided love with parents as the kids enter their teens. In their effort to be a friend, they neglect needed rebuke, and thus their love is lost. Love is lost. Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9, If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. 
But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. When we go to warn our neighbor, whether they be a neighbor next door or they be a neighbor within the family of God, when we go and warn them, we do so for their salvation, not to be right. Amen? I want people to know about Jesus and his holy Sabbath. I want people to know about God and the creation. I want them to know because this is life. This is the celebration of life. I'm not trying to just prove a point. Four, rebuke is most of the time designed to be redemptive. I say that because this has been pointed out to me. Scripture says that God has more than once rebuked Satan and his probation is closed. But otherwise, we are to give rebuke with the spirit of Luke 15. If we are following the Matthew 18 principle, they, ins- they, they insist and they insist on their rebellion, then treat them as one that is lost. If you are happy to see them leave when they've rejected your rebuke, then ask God for a new heart, for clearly you were never in the place probably to give rebuke in the first place. John Wesley and a preacher friend of his who had rather plain habits were once invited to dinner where the host daughter, who was, by the way, noted for her beauty, had been profoundly impressed and who the young, beautiful lady had been profoundly impressed by Wesley's preaching. It was during a pause in this gathering, this meal, that Wesley's rather conservative, plain friend took the young woman's hand and called attention to the sparkling rings that she wore. Ah, uh, what do you think of this, sir, for a Methodist hand? The girl turned crimson. Wesley, likewise, was embarrassed, for his aversion to jewelry was only too well known. But with a benevolent smile, he simply said, The hand is very beautiful. Wesley's remark both cooled the too hot water poured by his friend and made the foot washing gentle. The young woman appeared at the evening service without her jewels and became a strong Christian woman for the Lord. In these last days, which are typified with the story of Elijah, we see the need, we see the importance of the gift of prophecy, of protecting the prophets and their warnings, and yes, of giving faithful rebuke. This is the work we've been given. This is what a responsible family member does within the family. But remember, to give rebuke, you must first be able to receive it through the work of his prophets and his word. For in speaking of itself, Scripture states that it is given given and is profitable for rebuke. So I close with this appeal. Protect the prophets fearlessly speak for Jesus and call sin by its right name. Let's be honest and forgiving with one another. May we therefore, by God's grace, receive rebuke and humility, and may we also give it in humility. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you offered us um, salvation through Jesus, that you, re you offered us a loving rebuke, rebuke through your testimony of your life and even through your words, always offering the hope of a new life through you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to extend that good news, that everlasting gospel, with the warnings it includes to the world while there may be still time. Lord, may we not fear. May we bask in the presence of your will, in, the, in your presence through the written word, through the prophet's counsel, that we might be fitted up by you through your power and become an example and a testament of what you can do when a life says yes to you. Lord, please use us as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.